In this video, I'm going to talk about viruses, uh, particles that make us sick. In particular, we're going to think about the structure of viruses, what they're made of. As it turns out, they're made of some of the, some of the same molecules that make up living things, but we're going to try to justify why we consider viruses not living. Then we'll talk about how viruses uh, do what they want to do, break into actual living cells and use their resources and machinery to reproduce new virus offspring. And so we'll talk about kind of two ways that viruses try to reproduce themselves to keep their line going. So um, why do we consider viruses not living? Well, really, it boils down to the idea that they're just not a cell. They don't have many of the components needed to reproduce themselves all by themselves. They don't have very many enzyme proteins or resources to build new proteins or make new nucleic acids. And they don't really have a cell membrane or anything like that. And they're typically much smaller than real living cells, um, even prokaryotic cells, which we were said were much smaller themselves than eukaryotic cells. So viruses are really, really, really tiny little particles. Um, and that's why they're going to have to break into living cells in order to reproduce themselves, because they really don't carry much of, of anything except the instructions to build new viruses. All right. Um, so let's think about what viruses do actually have inside of them then. Um, they're really diverse in what they look like with really powerful microscopes. Um, but we can really think about two basic uh, components that all viruses have would be a capsid protein coat, which just sort of protects the rest of the, the contents inside. Um, and capsids may also help the viruses break into cells in the first place. And then there's some kind of nucleic acid with all of the instructions to build new viruses. There are DNA viruses and there are RNA viruses. So um, slight difference there, but basically they still have um, what they have in common is that they serve as instructions for building new viruses. All right, so how do viruses break into living cells in order to use their machinery? Um, the idea is that uh, whether it's a protein on the capsid surface itself, so um, this would be the outer part of this virus. As it turns out, some viruses actually have um, an envelope is actually what this is called um, at, on their outermost parts. Um, the envelope really is just stolen uh, cell membrane from a host that the virus left. Um, before it's trying to break into a new host. Um, so I don't really care about the envelope very much, but basically there's gotta be some kind of protein on the surface of the virus. So it might be on the envelope or it might be on the capsid itself. But basically that protein on the virus is gonna have a very specific shape that might enable it to fit the shape of a protein on the surface of the cell that it's breaking into. So presumably that membrane protein is there for some other purpose that serves the living organism. But uh, the virus protein maybe has this shape that kind of tricks it into allowing part of the virus to enter the cell. Now that's really important, this idea that it can only break into a particular protein because that's going to limit viruses into, as to what kinds of cells they might be able to break into. Sometimes we call this idea a virus's host range. Uh, maybe it can only break into cells that have the protein that it's capable of tricking. Uh, for multicellular creatures like us, that means that maybe viruses are only capable of breaking into certain cells in our body. Uh, for example, the flu virus might be only be able to break into certain cells in our lungs. Um, it doesn't break into our skin or our blood or our brain or anything like that. Um, and then also the idea is that you would expect different species to have very different receptor proteins on their uh, cell membrane surfaces. So typically a virus that's able to break into humans, uh, maybe when somebody sneezes who's sick with the flu or something like that, um, often those viruses can be kind of trapped within the droplets that we sneeze out. Um, but it would be very unlikely that we would sneeze on a plant and then the, the flu virus would be able to break into a plant's cells. Uh, plants are extremely different from us in evolutionary history, so their proteins on their cell surfaces are almost guaranteed to be different. Um, there are viruses that infect plants, but kind of vice versa, it would be very unlikely for plant viruses to ever make us sick. 
Sometimes viruses can mutate and those maybe surface proteins do have a different shape. Uh, so sometimes viruses can jump species with those mutations, but we would expect for it to be uh, maybe other animals that are more closely related to us that the, that the virus would jump to us. Okay, so let's just kind of finish this video by thinking about what a virus might do if it successfully breaks into a host cell. How might it um, uh, effectively reproduce itself? And there's kind of two broad strategies that we'll discuss, the lytic strategy and the lysogenic strategy. So in a lytic style attack, uh, maybe the virus down here um, successfully breaks in. Um, typically it's just gonna inject its nucleic acid into the host cell. And in a lytic strategy, basically that nucleic acid will immediately attract the attention of uh, machines or little enzymes in the host cell and immediately get that um, uh, nucleic acid copied. So it's gonna spend a lot of nucleotides in the host cell uh, copying all of those viral DNAs or RNAs, and then um, perhaps um, that parts of that nucleic acid will also be transcribed and translated in order to make all the new viral proteins. So essentially the lytic strategy is, is a very active strategy about telling the cell, hey, make new viruses. And in, in the case of a poor little bacterial cells, it turns out so many viruses might be created that the cell literally blows up and dies and releases all those viruses to go on and infect other bacteria. That typically doesn't happen in eukaryotic cells because eukaryotic cells are much bigger, but sometimes a lytic style attack might destroy eukaryotic cells because if uh, the virus is using so many of the, the host cell's resources, uh, amino acids to build proteins, uh, nucleotides to build nucleic acids, then maybe the host cell doesn't have enough left to do what it needs to survive. And so this is kind of a, a, what I would summarize, the lytic style strategy is, is a very active style of reproducing itself. In the lysogenic strategy, it's kind of a far sneakier strategy. So here is the viral nucleic acid inserting itself again, and maybe instead of directing the cell to immediately make new viruses, it instead kind of incorporates itself into the, the, the host DNA code and it sort of hides there. And the reason that might also be successful in terms of reproducing the virus is that if the cell undergoes cell division, it will sort of unwittingly copy the uh, virus as well when it makes two new cells. So here's a bacterium doing binary fission, and now there are two bacteria with the virus. And so this is kind of a, a, a stealthier strategy. Um, by hiding in the host DNA, if the host does cell division, then you're reproducing the virus as well. And it is kind of worth noting that lysogenic viruses can also go lytic. So they can kind of hop back out and then actively tell the cell to make new virus offspring. So um, we kind of just um, talked about how viruses are parasites. They do not have the equipment to make their own offspring. Um, but they can break into uh, host cells um, somehow and then with various strategies reproduce themselves.